Well, uh, welcome to day two of the Animal Law Symposium, State Confinement Laws and the Future of Farmed Animal Policy. We're so glad that you could join us. Uh, today, we'll host two panel discussions. The first is Congressional Response, the EATS Act, and other efforts to negate state-level progress for farmed animals, which will begin momentarily. And that will be followed by Looking Ahead, the Future of Farmed Animal Confinement Bans and Advocacy Efforts to prevent to Protect Them, which will start at 10.30 a.m. Pacific and 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, my name is Chris Green. I'm the executive director of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Um, super grateful to uh, to all involved for this wonderful symposium. Uh, I'd like to especially thank our events team for uh, doing so much work to get this all, pull us all together, and especially to our legislative affairs team, uh, Kim Kelly and Alicia Pirgoski, who's going to be on our next panel. Um, for just really putting some so much thought and 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 uh, uh, an effort into just really having such great substance uh, and a really just wonderful wonderful all around symposium. So before we get going, I've got a couple of housekeeping comments. Um, so please enter any questions you have in the Q and A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to the, as many questions as we can today. Uh, the symposium is being recorded and the recording will be shared with you later by email. So please use the Q and A box and and not the chat. Um, we're also going to have a quick poll uh, related to CLE, so um, uh, that should be popping on your screen momentarily. I am clicking yes, as I would certainly like uh, CLE credits. Oh, I was just told hosts and panelists can't vote, so no CLE for me, apparently. Uh, but please take a moment to answer the poll question. Uh, if you're seeking continuing legal education credits, uh, please click yes. And attorneys seeking credit will receive information by email after the symposium concludes. Okay, great. So uh, let's get started. So often when achieving legal advances for animals, and particularly farmed animals, it feels like the finish line keeps moving on us. As we heard in yesterday's first panel, broad coalitions of Animal Lab could spend an incredible amount of time, energy, and resources to pass major ballot measures restricting the extreme confinement of certain animals raised for food. These include Propositions 2 and 12 in California and Question 3 in Massachusetts. However, almost as soon as those measures were enacted into law, the ag industry filed a flurry of lawsuits to overturn them in the courts. And as we subsequently heard in yesterday's second panel, animal advocacy groups then have had to spend many more years fighting back these legal challenges. For example, eight years after it was passed, question three is still embroiled in litigation, embroiled in litigation with the Triumph case. And yet, even we, when we successfully defend these animal welfare protections and Prop 12's case all the way through the U.S. Supreme Court, the battle is still not over. Accordingly, in our next panel, we will learn about how opponents of farmed animal welfare advances are now trying to legislatively nullify these court rulings by introducing bills in Congress that would federally preempt U.S. states from setting their own health, safety, and welfare standards. Thankfully, the animal advocacy community and its allies are coalescing to beat back these attempts, but given that this is a farm bill year, that battle is far from over. So we have some wonderful experienced panelists with us today to give us an in-depth look at these attempts to legislatively overturn or prevent state animal welfare protections, as well as the strategies and campaigns for countering them. Uh, I'll introduce them now alphabetically. Uh, first, we have Ann Linder, who is the Associate Director of Policy and Research with the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy at Harvard Law Program at Harvard Law School, a place with which I'm somewhat familiar. Uh, next, we have Kelly McGill, um, the Legislative Policy Fellow, also with the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. Uh, we also have Alicia Prigoski, State Legislative Affairs Manager at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And last but certainly not least, we have Ann Sherman, the Solicitor General for the State of Michigan. So thanks to each and every one of you for taking the time to join us. Um, again, we have a just wonderful array of different perspectives included today. So I'm looking very much looking forward to the conversation. So we'll kind of start chronologically. Uh, Ann, Back in 2018, you authored a report that was instrumental in keeping an earlier version of the EATS Act, known as the King Amendment, out of the last farm bill. Can you give us a bit of historical context on the evolution of these attempts to nullify state animal protection measures and just sort of let us know how we all got here? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of understand. <laughs> yes, we've got a lot of ands on this panel. Uh, we're rich with ands. But, um, uh, but I can give sort of just a brief history of how we got here, where EATS came from, because I think understanding that history is really integral to understanding where we might go um, moving forward from here. So as many of you might know, EATS was kind of the progeny of an earlier attempt to circumvent these same kinds of state anti-confinement laws and the judicial opinions that upheld the constitutionality of those provisions. Um, 
As with EATS, it was the same sort of pesky progressive state that was responsible for uh, passing animal laws that inspired this response from the meat industry. So before um, EATS and Prop 12, um, there was Prop 2 in California, which um, contained welfare provisions for egg laying hens, allowing them to stand up, kind of turn around, fully extend their wings. Um, so Prop 2 was passed overwhelmingly by California voters um, in 2008. Um, it only applied to eggs produced within the state of California, but the California legislature then um, passed a companion bill, AB 1437, which expanded those requirements from Prop 2 to all eggs sold in California. Um, and that was then sort of signed into law by, by Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, and similarly to EATS, this really led to an immense effort to overturn those really modest welfare requirements. Um, that was led by the egg industry and egg producing states like Missouri. Um, so they took this issue to the courts uh, and when they failed there, uh, they brought it to the legislature and tried to instead um, overturn this California law by passing a federal law that would preempt it. Um, so the original version of, ats, of EATS rather, was known colloquially as the King Amendment. Um, the formal title of this bill was HR 4879. Um, it was known as the Protect Interstate Commerce Act or PICA. Um, ironically, PICA or PICA um, in the medical world is actually the name for a form of eating disorder in which a person eats things that are not usually considered food, like waste or hair or dirt or sand. Um, and PICA, the bill, would have overturned a wide variety of health and food safety regulations, uh, making it more likely that we all would have consumed little bits of these things. Um, so although its formal name uh, was the Protect Interstate Commerce Act, many of the bill's opponents uh, referred to this instead as the State's Rights Elimination Act, um, because it would have really severely tipped um, this, this balance of power um, and curtailed the regulatory ability of state and local governments across subject areas um, that have long been concerted considered within their regulatory purview. Um, so states have enjoyed authority to regulate for the health, safety, and morals of their citizens um, and goods sold within their borders, um, regardless of the origin of those goods. And this bill would have really kind of fundamentally transformed um, regulatory authority and that sharing between um, state and federal government by virtually eliminating their ability to regulate um, all agricultural products. Um, uh, coming into the state for sale. So historically, Republican lawmakers in particular have been really strong advocates for states' rights, um, many of which stem from the 10th Amendment, um, which allocates these plenary powers to the states. Bob Dole famously felt so strongly about this that he carried a copy of the 10th Amendment um, in his jacket pocket at all times and would bring it out for um, stem speeches and things like that. Um, on the court, Sandra Day O'Connor is probably the strongest proponent of 10th Amendment rights. Um, she was one of the only Supreme Court justices to serve as a um, state legislator prior uh, to being on the court. So she felt very you know, strongly personally about this. Um, but nonetheless, PICA was authored by a Republican lawmaker, uh, Representative Steve King, um, and it raised really serious sort of 10th Amendment concerns and one of you know, um, effectively neutered the ability of the states to regulate across a wide variety of agricultural products. Um, King was a congressman from Iowa's fourth congressional district, which is the largest producer of eggs um, in the country. So it's not surprising that he would want to champion this legislation that was being demanded by corporate egg producers at the time. Um, Apart from this, though, I think it's helpful to note that Steve King was kind of famously anti-animal, um, and he voted against consensus measures like um, trying to crack down on horse slaughter or post-Katrina disaster relief efforts to help pets. Um, he also tried to block an amendment that would have made it a crime to uh, attend a dog fight or bring a child to a dog fight. Um, so this uh, this bill and King's first attempt at doing this happened about a decade ago when he added this to the House version of the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and it appeared in the House version, ultimately there were Democratic senators who were strongly opposed to its inclusion. And so it was removed in conference committee and didn't appear in the final version of the bill. Um, he tried again in 2015 to introduce this as a standalone bill with uh, Republican co-sponsors and one Democratic co-sponsor. Um, 
But ultimately, uh, his best bet at doing this was to stick it on a large omnibus bill like the Farm Bill. Um, and so he reintroduced it in 2018. Um, and that's sort of how our research got started. He felt the best way to address this problem was through a legislative fix. Um, and even though in advocating for PICA's passage, he said he only knew of one law that it would overturn, namely California's Egg Bill. Um, in our research, we identified over 3,200 laws that spanned uh, a wide range of health, food, and safety regulations, things like importation requirements uh, to prevent the introduction of zoonotic disease or invasive species. Um, and so we've really kind of got started um, trying to understand what this bill would do because it seemed like up until that point, there hadn't been any um, reports released by King's office or by others um, that, that indicated that they really understood the limits of what they were asking for here. And they were using language that was just really dangerously broad. Um, so we undertook this research by, um, you know, doing things like going to grocery stores and reading labels and trying to just understand, given this definition of agricultural product he was using, which um, contained no de minimis exemption and, and was written, you know, 70 years ago and really didn't contemplate the sort of diversity of types of um, products used today, you know, what this bill would do in practice. Um, ultimately, King lost his seat in um, 2018, or, or sorry, he almost lost his seat in 2018, um, even though it was a, a R plus 30 district he was operating in, and he did lose his primary in 2020. Um, so, uh, so Pico was defeated, King was defeated, um, and, you know, he was sort of something of a pariah, even within his own party uh, to a certain extent. This was someone who kept a small Confederate flag on his desk, even though he represented uh, Iowa, which supported the Union. Um, so I think this personal kind of distaste for King did help um, in defeating what was ultimately a, a vastly overbroad and poorly written bill. Um, but, uh, but now that King's gone, his legislation lives on, um, and Eats is really kind of a recycling of the King Amendment in many different ways. It reuses a lot of the same basic language um, and it relies on the same sort of deeply flawed overbroad definition of agricultural product um, that was written many, many years ago and one that's broad enough to encompass everything from insulin to plastic bags to fireworks and firewood, things we wouldn't think of as normal agricultural products. Um, there are things uh, that Eats has learned from King and toned down. Um, it includes, for example, uh, limiting language to to um, indicate that this only applies to pre-harvest conditions, which is different from King, and we'll hear more about that later. Um, but really, this this sort of basic eats language has been kicking around for more than a decade now, um, and has come dangerously close to to passing um, in many cases. So, so this uh, that's a little bit about how we got here, um, and and what it might mean for um, for this going forward. Great, thanks so much, Anne, and. Uh, and Kelly, so you similarly authored a Harvard report last summer that addressed the EATS Act, uh, which is the latest legislative attempt to preempt or overturn Prop 12 in question three. And I know that the first, as Anne just alluded, the first version of the EATS Act was essentially verbatim a cut and paste version of the previous King Amendment. But with this version this year, uh, they have amended it quite substantially. Uh, can you explain to us a little bit how the EATS Act differs from the King Amendment and what some of its primary provisions are? Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. So building off of what Anne was just mentioning, the EATS Act is, is different in several ways from the King Amendment or Protect Industry Commerce Act or previous version of the EATS Act. One of the primary differences is that it limits its scope to pre-harvest production of agricultural products rather than to the production or manufacture. So it's theoretically targeting activities that happen before the later stages of processing in a product's life, uh, life cycle or supply chain. But the bill doesn't define what pre-harvest means. So it's unclear about how regulators or interpreting courts might interpret pre-harvest production. It could mean everything that relates to just on-farm activities, or it could mean all the way up to, for an exam for example, for an animal, all the way up until that animal is slaughtered. Uh, it could also encompass things that relate to inputs on-farm. So does the production of seeds, for example, that will then later be used in the 
production on farm of a crop or an animal feed product, does that fall within pre-harvest? So because there isn't a definition of what pre-harvest means, it is potentially still very expansive. And, and as Anne was just mentioning, it still relies upon a definition of agricultural product that is incredibly broad with, with very few limiting factors. And that, as she said, is an old definition that doesn't take into account the diversity of agricultural products that are currently on the market today or that include agricultural products as an ingredient. So it is more, more tailored in the sense of imposing some limitation in not in incorporating manufacture, but it's unclear exactly where those boundaries are drawn or where an interpreting court might find them to be drawn. So in our EATS Act report that we put out last summer, we found that over a thousand laws and regulations could be impacted. So that is that is narrower than what previous iterations um, would have potentially done, but it it's still incredibly broad and it raises the issue of sweeping in a whole bunch of unintentional laws and regulations that, as Anne briefly touched upon, relate to everything from food safety to pests and diseases, even potentially commercial fishing regulations, just a wide range of things that it's it's not clear that the drafters ever intended to be swept in, but that are swept in because this, this language lacks clear definitions of terms like pre-harvest. Um, Another difference between EATS Act and the King Amendment or Protecting Interstate Commerce Act is that it includes this new rule of con construction that basically states that a lack of federal, state, or local standards or conditions in a place of production, the state that it's being produced in for a given product, is itself a standard of condition. So in effect, because it would be incredibly difficult for a state or locality to tailor their regulations based on the origin of every agricultural product brought into that state or to track that then when trying to enforce it, this rule of construction, well, it's not clear. And I think it really would have to be left up to an interpreting court to figure out exactly what that new rule of construction language means. In practice, it might mean that a lack of standards in one jurisdiction of production in one state could, could mean that there's essentially a new de facto regulatory ceiling for that product or um, a pressure for a regulatory flattening where other states are then um, incentivized to reduce their own regulation for their in-state production, which would not be prohibited under the language of the EATS Act in order to avoid disadvantaging in-state competitors. So those are just a couple of exa examples of differences between this language of the EATS Act and the King Amendment. But basically, and I think you will be hearing more about it throughout the rest of this panel, but the lack of definitions in the EATS Act and the way things are phrased make it incredibly difficult to find out what exactly are the boundaries of it. And I think that those are things that would be difficult for regulators to figure out, difficult for producers to figure out, and difficult for reviewing courts, frankly, to figure out. To figure out. Great. And so, uh, Anne Sherman, um, so another unique fact feature of the EATS Act is uh, it adds a citizen supervision uh, and kind of astoundingly, uh, it doesn't just uh, allow folks to file suit over the core principles of the EATS Act, but it expands that. So it allows any person affected by a regulation governing, quote, any aspect of one or more agricultural products that are sold in interstate commerce to bring suit to block that regulation or seek an award of monetary damages. And even more shockingly, uh, it completely shifts, uh, you know, the burden of proof, which has existed for injunctions for for you know over 100 years. Where typically, if someone wants to enjoin a piece of legislation, they have to show that they would likely to prevail in court and that they would suffer irreparable harm if the regulation goes into place. What the Eats Act would do is flip that on its head and would say, if if, if the state of Michigan passes one of these laws. The burden would shift onto you uh, as the state of Michigan to show that you would be the one to prevail in court and you would have to show irreparable harm in order to stop the injunction. I mean, it's it's pretty surprising for anyone who's sort of knowledgeable about this law. This is a, a massive, massive shift. So can you can you talk a little bit about what impact the EATS Act would have on state laws and regulations and why is this, this matters to state officials such as yourself? Sure. Uh, the EATS Act would, uh, as both uh, Anne, Linder, and Kelly uh, reference, it, they, that act would jeopardize many, many laws and regulations across 
uh, I think all states, and potentially erect a barrier to new state laws that would attempt to regulate local concerns. Uh, you know, we have a long history, over 200 years, of states and local governments being responsible for ensuring safe and healthy food supply for their consumers, the, the residents that live in their state, and to ensure that, you know, farm products that are sold locally are, government, are governed by locally accountable elected officials. Um, states are really in a very unique position to know their problems, know their, their climate, know their jurisdiction, and to regulate in a way that is responsive to local circumstances and local needs. And uh, these are just basic principles of state sovereignty and, and also practical wisdom. And the EATS Act really just tramples on these fundamental prin principles. It, um, it takes away from states their ability to determine their own agricultural policies. And these are policies that uh, both protect and protect animals. And they're taking into concern um, local conditions and also the, the will of the people in that state. So like in California, the people decide, that's decided through, through Pop, Prop 12, how did they want, what, would, what did they think were the safety concerns with pork production? And also how did they think um, pigs should be treated in under certain conditions? Um, th that's what Californians get to do, uh, but not under the EATS Act. So from the state's perspective, the EATS Act would really jeopardize uh, many, many, uh, perhaps thousands of laws and regulations across the 50 states. I'll give you an example. I'm from Michigan. And in my state alone, the EATS Act would threaten varied laws, uh, anything from cage-free eggs to flammability standards for cigarettes to restrictions on the sale of, of foods that are past their due date. Uh, and the production of foods that aren't prepared in a commercial kitchen. These are very varied issues, and yet the EATS Act would potentially allow those uh, local concerns and uh, the laws that led uh, that, that were a result of those local concerns, those laws could fall. And one of the ways that the EATS Act does this is by I think forcing a sort of a lowest common denominator approach. So if one state, for example, would permit the sale or production of a particular agricultural product, even if another state thinks that that's a hazardous product or it maybe is produced under unacceptable production processes, every other state could be forced to do so as well. And that's what I mean by sort of that lowest common denominator. From the state's perspective, there is perhaps an even broader issue and why the EATS Act matters and why states like Michigan oppose the EATS Act. And that's because of state sovereignty. You know, if you take a step back and you think about what that is, sovereignty is something that allows the state self-control and autonomy without external interference. You know, when, um, we all know that the federal government can preempt state law. So there are times when uh, we have federal law and it's important to have a unified across the states. But uh, for the most part, you know, the, the US Supreme Court has repeatedly said every individual state as well as the United States, these are all sovereign jurisdictions. So every state has sovereignty. What does that mean? It means that the state can uh, seek to ensure the best it, it, uh, to, it can deliver to care for its people. So it ensures that the state can act independently, that it can enforce its own laws within its borders and protect its own interests. That's really what was issue, uh, at issue in the pork producers case. California wanted to decide how to best regulate pork production both for safety reasons and because Californians spoke uh, about how they wanted more humane treatment for pigs in their state, even if that meant for Californians that pork would cost more. So states have this right to function and make decisions about what occurs within their borders. They need to be able to protect that right. 
And apart from the times when it is very, very clear that a uniform federal law needs to bar individual state laws, it is really important to protect state sovereignty and to have that balance between state authority and local authority, um, state authority and federal authority. In, in our modern era, we have a very big federal government. We have a lot of federal agencies and we have a lot of federal laws. And that's why it's incumbent upon us now to make extra sure that the balance state and federal authority is really the right one. You have to strike that balance between a state's ability to address local concerns and um, with the ability to have an open marketplace among the states. And those are both very important. But in my view, the Supreme Court, both in the pork producers case uh, and also in the opposition to the EATS Act, really strikes the right balance. Thanks. And that, the sovereignty issue is so important because one thing that you hear from uh, opponents of animal welfare measures like Prop 12 is that, you know, California is trying to tell the rest of us states how we can, what we can do when in actuality, this EATS Act would do the exact reverse. It would allow states like Iowa, who want to have very lax animal welfare standards, dictate to every other state what they can or cannot do regarding that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, and I, I guess, again, that that state's um, ability to know its own problems, its own agriculture, and its own best solutions would, would go out the window. And it is somewhat, you know, one might say ironic, one might say hypocritical, that folks like Steve King, some of the proponents of the EATS Act and other measures, were some of the loudest states' rights voices in Congress when it came to women's access to reproductive health care or to, you know, deciding on whom one should marry, uh, you know, but yet when all of a sudden it affects commerce, they're like, you can't possibly let the states make their own rules. We need the federal government to come in and lay down the law, just sheer, sheer hypocrisy. So anyway. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so right now the focus is on the farm bill. Uh, it's pretty clear, I think, to many that something like the EATS Act would be extremely hard to pass as a standalone bill. Congress can't even barely pass infrastructure bills these days because they've become so politicized. So um, so the EATS Act, backed or EATS Act backers are adamant that this language be attached to uh, a must pass measure such as the farm bill. So can you talk a little bit about this latest push for the EATS Act to be included in the farm bill? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I mean, that's absolutely right. It is so hard to get anything done in Congress right now. I mean, like you just said, even even appropriations bills, which have to pass every single year. I mean, that is its own mess. And so the thought that something like the ETH Act, which is controversial, which has so much opposition, would pass as a standalone bill, it's just kind of not happening, you know? Um, so so the ETH Act conversation is definitely about the farm bill because we are, you know, as, as we've noted, we are also in a farm bill cycle right now. Um, so, that's kind of the general consensus on the Hill. And I do just want to make note of that. That's something that even the sponsors themselves have acknowledged, um, that the standalone is, is not likely to pass. And that's hugely significant. I mean, again, you know, because of all of the shenanigans going on in Congress, right, just generally, but but also because how of how much opposition there's been and how much outreach and advocacy from animal advocates and stakeholders and, and coalitions. And so I do just want to acknowledge that that plays a huge, huge part in kind of stalling out this standalone bill. Um, so just before we dive into, you know, the specifics of the farm bill and what's going on there, I just want to make sure that we have everybody on the same page with this whole standalone versus farm bill. Um, so, you know, standalone legislation, that's the bill language. That's the bill as it's introduced on its own. Some bills do pass that way, not a lot of them, um, but it does happen on occasion. Um, so it's, it's really advantageous for folks looking to get language passed into law to use these larger bill packages uh, like appropriation because it passes every year or like the farm bill because that has to get reauthorized every year. And so when we talk about, you know, standalone versus larger bill, larger bill package, something like the farm bill, it's essentially just trying to get language from a standalone inserted into a bill that we know eventually is going to pass and going to make it into law. Um, so it's kind of viewed as an opportunity, you know, and that's what's happening with the EATS Act right now. Um, because it's very unlikely that it's going to pass as a standalone, the focus is on trying to get that into the farm bill, which of course we're trying to stop. And I think um, Ann Linder kind of gave a, a great 
precursor history to what's happening again right now, because it is essentially just kind of the same thing that's happening, um, you know, not politically feasible to pass. So try to get it in the farm bill. Um, it's good news that it's stalled out on its own, but this is still a huge, huge threat. Um, and it's something that we are actively working to oppose. Um, there is a real risk that the exact language or some kind of similar language does end up getting included, at least in the House version of the farm bill. So that is what we're fighting against right now, inclusion in the farm bill. We do not want to see that. Um, we've heard that the exact language of the ETH Act may not be what's ultimately included. Um, it might look a little bit different, it might be some kind of alternative language, um, might function differently within the context of existing law. Um, so we don't know exactly what it might look like. But what we've heard is that essentially, uh, you know, there are going to be efforts to try and achieve the same result through whatever the language might be. So, you know, that's obviously very concerning. We've already seen a few iterations of this, right? With the previous bills, the King Amendment, um, talking about how they they look a little different, you know, do do things a little differently, but have the same effect, nullifying these thousands of state level laws, many of which do protect animals. Um, so we are watching for this um, and watching to make sure that we do everything that we can um, so that no version of this gets included in the Farm Bill. Um, so the process, the Farm Bill process this time around, as it kind of is every time around is a little bit of a saga. Um, you know, in theory, it's supposed to pass every five years. Um, so, so the current Farm Bill expires and then it has to get reauthorized every five years. Um, this was supposed to happen in September of 2023, but it did not. Um, Congress essentially, you know, there are just so many, so many points at which folks are at an impasse, so much other stuff going on in Congress that they wanted to deal with first. So they punted negotiations on this new 2023 farm bill down the line. Um, they passed an extension, one year extension to essentially give current farm bill programs um, the funding so that they wouldn't expire because that's a huge issue. You know, you don't want farm bill programs just expiring because Congress can't pass a bill. Um, so so they punted it down the line. So programs won't expire, but they have more time to negotiate. Um, so that really brings us to where we are now. Congress is still working on the farm bill and we're waiting to see text from the House and Senate Ag Committees. Um, the, the way this works is, you know, each of those committees, each chamber comes out out with its own version of text. They usually look very different. Um, and, and then they have to conference to try to get that to one unified bill. So we're still waiting to see that text, still waiting to see what that looks like. Um, and once we see that, that's going to help inform, you know, campaign strategy going forward. What we're hearing is that the House um, Ag Committee chair has He's, he's pretty adamant that he wants to include some types of ETH Act language in the House version of the Farm Bill. And then on the flip side of that, um, you know, on the, on the Senate side, we anticipate that keeping the Farm Bill or keeping the ETH Act out of the Farm Bill is going to be a priority for the majority there. So, you know, you can kind of see this impasse playing out right now. Um, the chambers are very far apart on this, the, the majority in each chamber. And so, you know, we kind of have to wait and see what the text looks like and see how, how to deal with that. Um, um, and then we'll kind of know, OK, this is what we want to see moving forward. This is how we're going to have conversations with the Hill moving forward. This is how we're going to do our advocacy to try and keep this out, um, just like with the previous versions of the King Amendment. Um, and then, you know, I'll also just note the ETH Act is, is one small piece of this farm bill fight. Um, there are much broader conversations and much broader disagreements happening that could also affect the timing of the farm bill as a whole and kind of continue to push us down the road. So, you know, we think that we might see language um, maybe in the next few weeks, maybe sometime this spring. Um, but realistically, when a bill gets passed, I mean, it's really it's a tough situation. This Congress with elections coming up in the fall, they're very busy. They're still trying to pass the budget. Um, so a lot of different factors that could kind of stretch this out. Um, but, you know, that just tells us that, OK, as long as they're having those conversations and negotiations, we're going to be working on this. This is um, this is going to continue to be an eighth act year and this is going to continue to be something that we oppose. And I, I think that just really underscores how. Um you know, how this is something, having to play defense on these things really does take so much time, energy, and resources from the animal protection movement. Uh, again, this is still to protect something that we've done positively, but it, it still is, is a big challenge. Um, and just to underscore about the, the standalone versus farm bill aspect of this, when Steve King did try to introduce his Protecting Interstate Commerce Act as a standalone bill in 2015, it couldn't even make it out of the House Ag Committee. 
uh, which just kind of shows you how there is very little chance of any of these measures standing on their own. So the only real chance that that producers have um, is it to attach it to something like this, because there's no way it would pass on its own. Um, so, Ann Linder, uh, your 2018 report, as you noted, identified over 3,200 laws that could have been jeopardized or overturned by the King Amendment. Um, and literally within less than 24 hours of it being released, it was being directly quoted by members of Congress during the House Ag Committee hearings over the Farm Bill, which I think was pretty, pretty amazing and impressive. And it kind of underscores the role that academia can play in sort of animal uh, protection uh, advocacy. Um, so in both 2013 and 2018, uh, the King Amendment made it into House versions of the Farm Bill, but not the Senate versions. Uh, that then moved those farm bill debates to what is known as the conference committee. Uh, can you explain that process to us and why it was so important to get that information in your report out to those conference committee members when we did? Yeah, so we were definitely working on a deadline uh, with this because even a great report, if you put it out um, after something's passed, really doesn't have the, the same potential impact to um, to shape the policy conversation uh, that it would earlier. So so uh, time is of the essence. Uh, and, and we've had many late nights trying to kind of compile this and get it out in a way where it could be useful um, to lawmakers who are really trying to kind of pass bills that they may or may not really understand in any great depth, especially when, as Alicia mentioned, there are so many different things being tacked onto this enormous bill. Um, it's it's very possible that things can slip through without being fully considered. And then it's only after the fact um, that people really are realizing what they what they voted for, or how it might be interpreted and understood. So um, so we we wanted to uh, to get this out there because, as I mentioned, there really was nothing that was looking comprehensively at what this bill would do, what it could do, what it would mean for, you know, for state governments, for the courts, um, you know, tying them up with thousands of lawsuits potentially for for many years to come trying to suss out exactly how this would be applied, whether or not, you know, portions of it were constitutional. There was a provision that um, authorized, you know, retroactive damage claims against the states for laws that they passed up to 10 years prior. So potentially this could have, you know, had the impact of, of bankrupting, um, you know, many state and particularly municipal governments that had passed regulations dating all the way back to, um, to 2008. Um, because he wanted to 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 be able to authorize damages for that California um, egg bill, um, in particular. So so to your question about um, a conference committee. So a conference committee is a joint committee. Um, in order to pass a um, something like this into law, like the Farm Bill, it has to be passed by both the House of Representatives, by the Senate. Um, and then ultimately signed by the president into law. Um, and so both the House and the Senate are kind of working in parallel on their different um, versions and their House Ag Committee and the Senate Ag Committee. Um, and then they're voting forward different language. Um, but in order to uh, to pass those two versions, the House version and the Senate <coughs> version have to be reconciled. They have to be absolutely identical. Um, and so conference committee is, is a joint committee um, with members of each, and their job is basically to kind of look for all of those disagreements between the House version and the Senate version um, and reach some sort of um, agreement and some sort of unified language that they both can uh, live with, um, if not like, at least. Um, and so this often involves, you know, um, negotiations, some sorts of, you know, uh, legislative force trading, that kind of thing. And so while we saw King um, in the House version of the Farm Bill, it did not appear in the Senate version. And many, um, particularly Senate Democrats, were were very opposed um, to, to King. Um, and so ultimately, it was removed during that conference committee process, as it was during, um, you know, the prior Farm Bill fight. Um, and that, you know, oftentimes is the case because these different bodies have different sort of priorities, they have different, you know, kind of political temperatures. Um, and so those kinds of disagreements happen often. Um, we were happy to see that in this case, uh, I think cooler heads prevailed um, and this this legislation, which was written, you know, so broadly, um, uh, was was ultimately taken out. Um, as Chris mentioned, you know, in this line of work, sometimes you don't know um, who is going to be reading uh, the words that you're writing. And it can feel at times, you know, like you're sort of 
putting things out into the ether. Um, but that was very much not the case here. And um, we were really fortunate that within, you know, even hours of publishing this, um, we heard both Democrats um, and Republicans uh, quoting from our report um, in the uh, the conversations around this bill. Um, and we've heard, you know, uh, through from several different offices sort of how crucial this report was to them in helping them understand the problems with the bill as it was written um, and kind of the vast amounts of uncertainty um, that it would have potentially uh, introduced. If you read the text of Eats or the text of King, um, it can sound sort of deceptively straightforward. Um, but what we really tried to do with our work was kind of pull out all of those questions um, and point to, you know, all of the ways in which this could uh, be interpreted one way or another way with vastly different results. Um, and really kind of give a sense to um, legislators of what this would do in practice on the ground to issues that are cared about in their community, to producers in their state, to consumers in their state, um, and, and try and make this as concrete as we could. So we put together this large index of um, over 3000 laws that we found that would have potentially been preempted because the language of, of King swept so broadly. Um, and those included everything from you know, requirements about um, not selling baby food in jars that contain BPA uh, to import restrictions on firewood that were intended to keep invasive pests out um, of states to prevent them from destroying the forests or, um, or agricultural products. Um, and so it was really just this huge wide range of of laws that we put together in this index um, and and cataloged for um, legislatures. And I think um, one way in which that was helpful is it gave them really sort of specific examples of things they could point to. I think it opened their eyes to things that were going to be affected by this bill that maybe they cared about, but they didn't realize would have been swept up by this broad language um, and, and kind of uh, gave them natural allies. If they, if they were inclined to oppose King, I think we gave them um, you know, the permission to do so by, by really um, laying out very clearly sort of what um, that would mean for constituents in their state. So just to give you one example, um, one of the, the regulations that we mentioned there was from uh, Minnesota, and it had to do with labeling of wild rice. Um, there's two different ways you can make wild rice. You can either have paddy harvested wild rice, um, which is this really sort of labor intensive process where you go out in canoes and knock it off um, into the canoes, dry it, um, and it's naturally occurring, naturally growing in Minnesota. And um, Minnesota is a very proud wild rice producing state. Um, that kind of rice has much higher um, nutritional value, we think, than the alternative, which is this cultivated uh, variety of wild rice, um, sort of an oxymoron there, that's produced primarily in California. So Minnesota cares deeply about its wild rice production, um, and they have a labeling law that um, required that um, it we distinguish between patty harvested traditional wild rice and artificially cultivated wild rice. Um, that was one of those laws that, you know, you never would have think this would apply to, um, but in, in Minnesota, um, you know, that's something that was persuasive so that consumers can distinguish, you know, between those two products and make informed choices um, about what products they wanna consume. Um, so I think this really kind of um, helped give those uh, lawmakers um, the ability to understand, at least even in this brief limited window, and we we did not, you know, sort of pretend that this was comprehensive. But in putting this out, we really just said, look, we looked at this issue. Here's just a sample of what it could potentially um, sweep up. And so I think um, that really helped them kind of realize um, all of the different industries that would be impacted. We're not talking about just egg producers. We're talking about you know, um, a huge, huge range of issues from drug laws to um, to labeling restrictions, commercial fishing and, and everything in between. So I think it was helpful and persuasive um, in that respect. Yes, yeah, so it's great to see it being used. Yeah. And, and one real concern about conference committee is that it is such a black box. It, these votes are not public votes. This horse trading that happens, no one really knows. The only thing that the public sees is what comes out of that box. And then both chambers have just a straight up, up or down, yes, no vote. There's no ability to, so that's why it, it's so crucially, 
we were very fortunate in each of the past two farm bills uh, to get the King Amendment knocked out in conference committee. Um, but the best thing we can possibly do is just to keep it out of the House version of the bill in the first place. So we don't then have to worry about what, what's happening in that black box. And and yes, as Ann mentioned, these 3,200 laws, this report, it was over 250 pages. Uh, I was helping edit that. I remember we had a, a month of weekends working 12 hour days, uh, just, just compiling that all and editing it. So uh, again, it was... Uh, just such a great way to see that how, as I mentioned, how the impact of academia and having Harvard's name on this report that that really actually didn't primarily focus on the animal welfare aspects. It focused it on focused on everything else and really gave enough hooks in there that every legislator who was thinking about this would likely be impacted by one of those 3,200 laws in their own districts and gave them a, you know, a reason to worry about it. Um, so Kelly, in your report, similarly to Anne was just alluding, um, there were even some surprising things that that you were able to unearth that the the Eats Act would would impact, and one of those are potentially overturn, and one of those were some things that would be harmful to ag producers themselves, such as uh, reducing Iowa's ability to uh, inspect animals for infectious diseases or sanitation requirements on any agricultural animals that were being imported or passing through the state. So. Are pork producers and other ag producers unified in their support of a legislative fix to Prop 12? And if not, why not? And, you know, since Prop 12 already has gone into effect and many producers already are making significant capital expenditures to modify their housing practices so they can comply with Prop 12 and have access to the California market, how big a factor is time in determining whether or not something like the Eats Act gets passed or added to the Farm Bill? Yeah, thanks, Chris. To, to give you the answer very briefly, and then I'll expand upon it a little bit more, producers are definitely not unified against Proposition 12 or Massachusetts Question 3 and other laws like it. Um, there's We've heard opposition from producers against the EATS Act and in favor of maintaining Prop 12 and other, and the ability of states to enact and enforce laws like that. And the longer time goes on, the we think the less likely it is that there will be, you know, producers speaking out against it. And this is because many producers have already made investments in upgrading their facilities and they are continuing to make those investments in order to be able to sell into markets like California and Massachusetts and comply with Proposition 12 and Question 3. Um, Clemens Food Group, for example, is the fifth largest pork processor and its subsidiaries and independent producers together um, are in the top 10 in the country for the number of sows that they raise. And Clemens has spoken out against the EATS Act, saying that it would undermine their investments that they've made over the past few years in order to be compliant with Prop 12 and Q3. They're basically on the record as saying that they view Prop 12 as a win-win for itself and for its producers because it opens up new markets opportunities for them. And in fact, they've recently doubled their market share because they are compliant and are able to sell into California. Other producers, especially smaller scale farmers, have never used the type of confinement systems that Proposition 12 and Question 3 prohibit. A good example of this is Nyman Ranch, which is a Purdue subsidiary that works with hundreds of family farmers, none of whom create their pigs. We haven't just heard from pig, pig or pork producers either, we've heard from egg producers, other animal producers, and producers of a whole range of agricultural products that they don't want this type of federal prohibition and, and that they actually want to maintain the ability of states to set their own standards for products that enter and are sold within their borders. So essentially what, what the EATS Act would do is disrupt the investments that producers have made um, to comply with Prop 12 and Question 3 and reduce market opportunity for smaller scale producers to compete against some of the largest producers. And so the longer that Proposition 12, Question 3 remain in effect, the less likely it is, from my perspective, that EATS, is, EATS Act or something like it is likely to pass, especially because business leaders and producers value certainty. And right now, they know the standards that they have to meet to, meet, to sell into California and Massachusetts. They've known them for years. Question 3 was passed in 2016, Proposition 12 in 2018, and Enactment of EATS Act or other federal legislation would just inject more uncertainty into the market. And that uncertainty likely would last for years to come as regulators figure out how to implement it and as 
the provision in whatever form it ultimately took, if it were passed, worked its way through the courts because it's very likely to be challenged. And it would take time for that litigation to go through the courts. And so as more producers are working to comply and are choosing to comply in order to access those markets, the fewer producers, frankly, there are likely to be over time because more will have chosen to comply voluntarily in order to be able to sell their products in those states. Great. Um, so, Anne Sherman, stepping back for a moment, um, we discussed in a previous panel that state attorneys general can, through their offices, submit briefs relevant to the legal matters before the court. What role did Michigan play in the recently decided U.S. Supreme Court case of the National Pork Producers Council versus Ross? And what impact do you think that had on the outcome? Is there a similar role for the state uh, and other states uh, to play as Congress considers the EATS Act? Uh, well, Michigan banded with Illinois, and we co-led a multi-state amicus brief that was joined by 13 other states. So we were a coalition of 15 states that filed an amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court in a pork producer's case, and we supported California's uh, Prop 12. But when states file amicus briefs, or when anybody files an amicus brief to the court, the court doesn't want to hear the same arguments that the parties are making. So California had already covered the ground of sort of the ins and outs of the, the housing of pigs and, and the um, what California's wanted and, you know, all the safety concerns. And so uh, it was it was obvious we knew what the legal issue was that California had put forth. And that's that the claim in pork producers was that by regulating the sale of pork products in California, California was improperly reaching out beyond borders and telling other states how they had to house their own products. And that was a violation of the Commerce Clause and specifically the Dormant Commerce Clause and this strain of the Dormant Commerce Clause that we call the extraterritoriality principle. And that's the reaching out beyond the borders. That's what the extraterritoriality principle means. So we knew that our theme for our brief was going to be that states have a, a powerful sovereign interest in exercising their police powers, that they need to enact laws that promote health, safety, and welfare of the residents. And sometimes those laws do have an incidental effect outside the borders. Um, the question was how we could really impact the court. And um, we, we believe that the role we could play that was a little different than California's but would support California was to actually show the court from states' perspectives how a lot of um, their local concerns and their ability of states to address local concerns um, would be hampered in a lot of areas other than just how you house pigs. So it, it's a little bit, uh, I, I think, very uh, similar to what Ann Linder was talking about. H how do you impact legislators? What well, you show legislators that lots of other things are going to be affected as well. And that was what our state multi-state brief did, the amicus brief did to the court. We weren't just focused on how you are going to house pigs. We were focused on the other areas where state would fall if every time it had an inc incidental effect on another state, it was going to be suspect and it was going to be considered extraterritorial uh, legislation of another state. So uh, I'm going to take a step back because, you know, uh, the dormant commerce clause is not exactly a household term. So I think a little background might be helpful. The commerce clause grants Congress the power to regulate commerce. Uh, the languages among the several states. So the Commerce Clause has, it's kind of a negative aspect to it. That's what we call the dormant Commerce Clause. And that negative aspect denies the states the power to unjustifiably discriminate against or burden the interstate flow of articles of commerce. So that unjustifiable is an important word because uh, they can burden commerce, but they can't do it unjustifiably. 
unless Congress has regulated to the exclusion of states, so Congress has preempted all state law, unless that happens, the states still have the authority to regulate their own internal affairs, including laws that regulate uh, the internal commerce of a state. Um, the whole point of the Dormant Commerce Clause is to foster a free marketplace. And that's what the Dormant Commerce Clause is concerned with. And what it really uh, focuses on is, do you have a state that's protectionist? It's passing laws to protect its own economic interests at the, at the expense of another state. And I'll give you an example. You know, if, uh, if uh, a state law prohibits dealers of a particular food product uh, from selling that product uh, at a lower price than the product might be sold within a particular state. It, the, a state can't do that. It can't protect itself and its own economic interests at the expense of commerce. Um, they can't erect an economic barrier against competition with products of another state or the labor of residents of another state. But the Dormant Commerce Clause doesn't prevent states from regulating for the good of its residents. And that's what we tried to tell the court and show the court. When the state acts even-handedly and it's a legitimate local public interest that the law is geared toward and its effects on interstate commerce are only incidental, it's uh, it's gonna be upheld unless there's, there's sort of an, a, a, a balance problem where the benefits to the state are offset by the burdens to other states. So it's sort of a, we call it the Pike balancing test. The modern reality of our economy is that states often regulate activities that occur entirely within the state, but have an effect on other states. But our state residents have come to rely on these important protectors in a lot of areas when they purchase goods when they procure professional services, when they engage in financial transa uh, transactions. And so what we tried to do in our amicus brief was give the court some examples of how expanding the extraterritoriality doctrine would be bad for lots of areas are important to residents and important. So as we talked about, uh, well, we did talk about food safety protections, and that gets a little closer to California's Prop 12. So food supply, uh, regulating standards that govern the food supply uh, that are either manufactured and produced in the state or in other states. But we also talked about um, laws that uh, govern the sale of dangerous goods. For example, uh, children's toys healthcare products, household goods. We talked to the court about price gouging statutes. These are laws in many, many states, almost every state has one, and they prevent consumers from paying excessive prices for goods and services. So that the regulation of, sort of price gouging has largely been left to the states. The federal government thinks it's important, but doesn't really have a lot of laws to govern it. And a lot of those laws uh, are important and could fall if the court had expanded this extraterritoriality doctrine. You know, as an example of that, uh, the Sixth Circuit recently upheld a Kentucky law, a price gouging law that um, applied to online merchants and out of state out of state pricing, and had the court had an expanded view of extraterritoriality, that important price gouging law would have fallen, but the Sixth Circuit upheld it. We talked to the court about energy programs. Um, there are many states, I think most states now have what we call renewable portfolio standards. And these are um, standards that require electric suppliers to source a portion of their annual electricity sales from solar, wind, and other renewable energy sources. So obviously a great way for states to diversify their energy portfolio. Uh, and, but these, they can have, an, these laws can have a, a, 
an indirect influence on energy companies and markets that go beyond state borders. But the federal courts have appropriately upheld these uh, renewable portfolio standards against dormant commerce class challenges. And the last area that we talked to the court about was regulations that curtail lending and financial. These are laws applied to transactions that have an in-state nexus, but where another entity in another state could be involved. A lot of times companies, you know, we, we have such uh, multi-state and multinational kinds of uh, it, uh, economic uh, and financial transactions nowadays that a lot of times our financial track uh, transactions involve a company that does business in a lot of different states. So a, a financial law that's passed in one state could indirectly affect out-of-state conduct. And yet, these are also that have been upheld uh, against dormant commerce clause challenges to the support. In a lot of these areas, not just housing pigs, but a lot of different areas, if you expand the concept of uh, what it means for a state to uh, affect uh, states' laws other than their own, you're going to have a lot of problems and a, a lot of citizens that are relying on these protections are going to suffer. We think that that was um, crucial to the court in understanding, practically speaking, what could happen uh, with the legal uh, issue that, that was at play in the Dormant Commerce Clause case. Um, you asked uh, whether there's a similar role for states um, as Congress considers the EATS Act, and the answer is yes. Um, states often band together to let congressional leaders know their views on various uh, proposed laws. And in fact, Michigan and Illinois once again banded together to do just that. Uh, relatively recently, we wrote a letter uh, and we circulated it amongst the states and got 13, 14 other additional states to sign on. So we were a coalition of 16 states that wrote to congressional leaders of the EATS Act. And what we said was, this is, this is not good for the states. Uh, some of our important protections are going to fall if you, if you allow the EATS Act to, to get passed. So we had Michigan, Illinois, Arizona, California, Connecticut, District of Columbia, Hawaii, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, and Pennsylvania, and Vermont, all who joined us in writing congressional leaders to oppose the EATS Act. Um, we said it was an incursion into the rights of states and local governments to regulate their own agricultural products. Great. Well, Alicia, the, the ETS Act was introduced, we had a question come in, so I'll address part of that now. The, the ETS Act was introduced by Kansas Republican Senator Roger Marshall and Iowa Republican Representative Ashley Hinson, each with around a dozen or so initial Republican co-sponsors. Yet so far, no Democratic senators or representatives have signed on to the ETS Act as co-sponsors. And currently, House Republicans have such a slim majority, they can only afford to lose two of their own votes Yet something like 12 House Republicans have said they would never vote for any farm bill, no matter what. So it's clear that to have any chance of passage, uh, any farm bill that's put forth would have to be somewhat by, done in a somewhat bipartisan manner. So you've been lobbying on the Hill and meeting with congressional offices, encouraging members of Congress to oppose the EATS Act since it was introduced. Can you tell us about how those conversations are going and talk about some of the organized opposition to the EATS Act within both the House and Senate and how those members have expressed that opposition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it's it's such a good point. You know, I, I think that what's really powerful right now and, and is um, in favor of, you know, folks who are opposing the fact is the fact that there is bipartisan opposition to it, but there's not yet bipartisan support. So absolutely, that's a really good point, Chris. Um, so yeah, we've been doing dozens and dozens of meetings um, on both sides of the aisle on the Hill since the EATS Act was introduced, really just trying to um, 
get into those conversations and, and speak with legislators and their staff members about our concerns um, and, and about the concerns with this bill, many of which have been shared already. Um, you know, just again, um, kind of a, a shout out to the Harvard report. We bring that up a lot in these meetings, the direct meetings with the congressional offices, because it is so powerful when you have those exact laws. You know, you're going into um, a meeting with uh, a member of Congress who's from a specific state, you have that specific set of state laws that you can talk about. It has been immensely powerful to have that in these meetings. Um, so, you know, I think that there are some really interesting trends, really interesting takeaways. One of those um, is that everybody knows about this, um, which I think is a, is a good thing. You know, you walk into really any office and mention, hey, one of our priorities is the EATS Act. We have concerns about this. And usually we get met with the response of, yes, we're familiar with that. We've heard about that. Um, and it's it's not just from um, nonprofit organizations. It's not just from, you know, kind of those professional stakeholders or entities. It's from constituents, too. Um, that's a really powerful thing. You know, often we ask um, we ask staff members, OK, what are the what are the animal issues, the agricultural issues that you're hearing about from constituents? And a lot of times they will say we're getting so many calls in opposition to the EADS Act. I mean, this happens to us like every week on the Hill, um, which is, is a good thing. You know, again, just emphasizing that um, the power in constituent contact and outreach and um that is real and, and advocacy that is absolutely real. And we're seeing that in a lot of these meetings, um, you know, so general general awareness of the Eats Act, general awareness of the concerns. That's a really good thing. Um, another takeaway uh, that's that's been really interesting. Like I said, we've been doing these meetings on both sides of the aisle. We are able to have those productive conversations, regardless of whether the offices we're meeting with are aligned with us in our opposition or might not be. Um, this is such an important issue that it's important to have those conversations no matter what um, and meet with offices where the views might not exactly align. Um, we we sometimes we know that going in, sometimes we don't know that going in, you know, where folks are going to be where folks are going to stand on this. Um, but just having having that conversation, listening to the perspective, asking questions and, and then ultimately letting them know what our concerns are with the bill. Um, you know, sometimes it's possible to to change some minds. Um, and even if it's not, it's important to have that conversation because it just shows that. Um, this is something folks are concerned about. This is something organizations are concerned about and constituents. And, you know, especially when you get um, a lot of constituents who are concerned about it, that's going to raise some flags. So no matter what, we really try to have those conversations strategically um, on both sides of the aisle with folks who do um, oppose the EATS Act and, and who also, you know, are on the other side of that and are in support of it. Um, you know, and then I will say of the members who are opposed, um, it's been really interesting to kind of hear about the specific concerns. Um, they vary based on a lot of factors, you know, what states, um, what kind of industries are present in the states, um, what kind of agriculture is present in the states, what they're hearing from constituents, um, and then, of course, the specific state laws that would be invalidated by the EADS Act. Um, you know, but overall, kind of just looking at um, looking at all of those, the meetings and, and all of the conversations, um, one thing that really sticks out to us is that folks are concerned about the number of state laws that would be invalidated by this and the fact that it would tie the hands of state legislatures from doing what is best for the agriculture industries in those states. I mean, over and over and over again, you know, we're hearing kind of those two main points about why people are so concerned about this and why members of Congress are so concerned about this as well. Um, you know, that's just kind of some of the, the takeaways from the direct lobbying. Um, and then in terms of the um, organized opposition, I will also just mention, um, there is a lot of opposition to this present in Congress already. Um, over 200 members of Congress, 172 representatives and 30 senators signed on to letters opposing the EATS Act. Um, and that is that is really significant. You know, you you think about the fact that there are only 100 senators. Um, so you get 30 of them to proactively express opposition to really anything. And that is going to be a huge challenge to get that moved through, um, you know, because that's not even counting all of the folks who might still oppose it, but just didn't want to sign on to the letter. Um, I mean, that's a big, big number. Um, and so the fact that there is 
so much of that organized opposition within Congress is huge, you know, and that's not even to mention um, the hundreds of stakeholders and farmers and state legislators um, and consumer safety groups, you know, all of those other outside stakeholders who are also weighing in who do have sway um, with members of Congress because they are constituent groups. Um, so, you know, I will say one thing that that I, I think that all of us, you know, all of those entities and all of those groups and stakeholders really do well is, is work together, um, work together as a coalition um, to continually come back and, and try to defeat this. Well, well thanks. Um, and yeah, I mean, the partisan aspect of this is kind of interesting and does cut a bit both ways. So I think, Many, and this question is for, for Ann Linder, I think many were surprised that the Biden administration filed a brief in support of the pork producers challenge to Prop 12. Uh, seems a bit odd, even politically, that they would want to overturn the will of 63% of California voters in order to appease red state ag interests that are unlikely ever to support a Democratic administration. Um, also, you know, overturning elections is sort of a timely hot button issue these days. So is there a hesit hesitancy that you've detected among elected officials to overturn or even preempt laws passed through ballot initiatives in light of the growing concerns about election interference or protecting democratic processes in general? And has any of that sentiment been palpable in any of the public discussions around EATS? Yeah, that's a good question and, and one that I think I think my fellow panelists may have um, good insight on as well, um, since, you know, we're somewhat siloed in this this uh, wacky world of academics. Um, as to the, the wisdom of the Biden administration um, joining the, the pork producers um, on their case, I can't can't really speak to the logic there. Um, but I think that there is a real concern that, you know, these laws, when they passed, um, oftentimes they're not squeaking by. Um, they're passing by really significant margins. Um, and they're gaining traction with both Democratic, Republican, and independent um, voters as well. Um, so, so they are racking up huge margins. And I think, um, you know, many, many of us on this call would probably agree that animal welfare is maybe one of those issues where the public is out ahead of um, legislatures in, in many cases. And there's reasons for that. Um, you know, the the um, meat industry and in, in particular is really effective as a political force. Um, there's a lot of uh, money and donations and, um, and lobbying that goes towards keeping um, as little regulation as, as possible in, in many of those instances. But if you're talking to folks on the street, I think most people would agree, and there's polling that indicates this, as well as the passage of the laws that, um, you know, those of us who eat meat want to know that those animals were raised humanely. And, you know, there's very few people who, um, who really kind of disregard this issue altogether. Now, I think it's one where public opinion um, is shifting. Um, and, and these laws are, you know, great indications of that, that it carries broad support, which is why they're such a threat to, um, you know, these entrenched industry interests and, and why they're, um, you know, something that we see only really in states that have ballot initiatives um, and allow for that kind of direct democracy. Um, I think, uh, you know, that there have been other instances of issues lately, um, you know, abortion rights, for example, is one that comes to mind where when you have this large delta between sort of where the public is on an issue, regardless, you know, of how we all feel about that as individuals and where the legislature is, um, that that does have, you know, sort of consequences as far as, um, you know, through our political process, um, people are, are voicing their displeasure when that gap becomes too large between what the, what the law is um, and what the populace believes on a particular issue. Um, so I think, you know, particularly, um, you know, now um, on the side of of um, the 2020 election, there are fears about um, interfering too directly um, in in democratic elections. Um, I'm not sure how much that's come up in EATS, but I think it's a concern um, that's at the forefront of um, of many representatives' minds when we think about sort of the, the fragile state um, of democracy, there's a need to, regardless of how you feel about these issues, protect the democratic um, process. So I don't know if Anne or Alicia, you you all want to say any more about that, but that's my my uninformed academic opinion. And I actually have, an, uh, have some thoughts on this. That that you know, I, I've traveled internationally quite a bit, and I, I, right after COVID, and you still saw like 
inflation that whoever was ahead of any of these countries was getting blamed for this like global inflation phenomenon that was a result of COVID. And I think, you know, the job of any elected official is to get reelected as they see their, their primary, their role and goal. Um, so I think anything that uh, administrations think will raise the price of food will something that they'll get directly blamed for. And I, so I think that might be the only real way to justify why the Biden administration might have supported this, because they were kind of convinced that this would increase the price of food. But what's fascinating is that we've seen the exact opposite. So they said that passing Prop 12 was going to make the price of pork grow up nation, go up nationwide, when even in California, according to the USDA numbers, the price of pork is only, you know, Prop 12 compliant pork has only gone up about six cents per pound. But what we've seen in the rest of the country, because now you have all this non-compliant pork that can't get into California, it's going on the open market. And so you've actually seen, there's a glut. So you've, you've now, and it's pretty ironic too, when you've got all these pork producers who themselves have paid out hundreds of millions of dollars in recent years for artificially conspiring to increase the price of pork, that now they're screaming that the price of pork is going to go down. Um, I was screaming that it's going to go up. And yeah, what we've actually seen is nationwide, the price of pork has dropped uh, quite significantly because of Prop 12. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, I've got questions for each, uh, Kellyanne and, and Alicia. So Kelly, can you talk a bit more about the core constitutional questions uh, around the federal government trying to tell states or voters what they can or cannot do regarding setting their own health, safety, and welfare laws? And if the EATS Act or similar, even narrower legislation were enacted, what would happen next? Would that be the end of these debates? Would we just lose and everyone go home? <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I think it's I think it's fair to say that any determination of constitution would constitutionality would have to happen by interpreting courts, and that would depend on the exact phrasing of the language passed. If it's EATS, um, that raises significant constitutional questions. If it's something similar to that, I think to my mind that also would raise constitutional questions, but of course it depends on the exact form of the language. Um, the broad constitutional questions that, that EATS implicates have to do with, as we've already been speaking about, issues around state sovereignty and fundamental principles of, of federalism and the way that the interaction between our federal government and our states was set up under the constitution. The 10th amendment, protects states to do things that um, Congress um, hasn't done or that the Constitution hasn't allocated to Congress's power. And within the Commerce Clause powers that Congress has, there, there is a wide swath of things that Congress can proactively do, but there's this question of, of the limits of federal preemption authority uh, when Congress has chosen not to act. So the EATS Act, because of its broad scope, has a potential to tell states they they cannot regulate goods imported and sold within their borders um, in a whole range of areas that Congress has imposed no federal laws or regulations on, such as, for example, on-farm production of, of animals. There's, there's very little federal regulation of that type of activity. So can Congress validly exercise federal preemption in an area where, where it itself has chosen not to act. I think that's a that's a constitutional question that that interacts with jurisprudence around 10th Amendment. I don't think there's a clear answer right now based on the EATS Act legislation. And again, I think it would it would it would really be determinate upon the actual final form of the language. But I think it's worth noting that Alicia mentioned some of the Democratic opposition in Congress to the EATS Act, you know, 172 Democrats. 29 Democrats in the Senate and one Republican in the Senate, but there's also 16 Republicans who signed a first letter and then another 10, eight, eight of whom were not overlapping. So 24 total House Republicans who have signed letters opposing the EASE Act or similar legislation on the basis that this threatens states' rights. The quoting from the, the most recent House Republican letter, they, they note that the EATS Act and its legislative offshoots are, quote, at odds with our foundational Republican principles of states' rights, national security, and fair competition. That's Republicans saying that. So there's not unified views either that Prop 12 violates states' rights or that the EATS Act would be, would be at all compatible with states' rights, frankly. Um, so to answer your other question, Chris, if, if the EATS Act or similar narrower le legislation were enacted, would these debates be over? Definitely not. I think 
regulators would have a huge challenge in front of them figuring out how then to proceed, which of their laws and regulations could they continue to enforce? How do they proceed with new ones, especially in light of things like the private right of action under the EATS Act or, or again, not seeing other language, um, how that might interact? How producers would then figure out what they can and cannot do and what markets they can and cannot access? And then beyond that, the, the whole issue we've already been talking about, about litigation in the courts, I think if the EATS Act or something similar were passed, there would be years to come of litigating and to try and figure out the boundaries of this legislation, especially because in its current form, these terms are not defined and the boundaries are not defined. And I think that presents an immense challenge for, for judges, their law clerks, regulators, state government officials and producers, and frankly, consumers too, to figure out how to proceed under this this legislation that in its current form would, would upset, as we've been talking about, potentially hundreds or thousands of laws and regulations. Yeah. And I think, you know, certainly the animal advocacy community community would not take this sitting down and they would be the ones in filing legal challenges to try and enjoin or uh, challenge the um, any EATS Act or something like that. So, uh, yeah, this is likely to to be the, the start of another fight, not the end of it, for sure. Um and Sherman, uh, I'm aware that other groups of state attorneys generals that may not be as enlightened as those in Michigan uh, oppose uh, measures such as Prop 12 and Question 3, uh, and were filed amicus briefs in uh, in support of the pork producers in the Prop 12 case um, and support over determined legislativity. Have you had conversations with your counterparts in some of those other states about these issues, and are you able to see any validity in their perspectives? So... Uh, I'll answer the first part of that question. You know, have I had conversations with other states uh, that uh, opposed Prop 12 or that have supported the EATS Act? No. I, I, I will say that, that in general states, we have a mechanism to try to talk about issues that might affect states. And we have an umbrella organization called the National Association of Attorneys General. So they do a lot of educational um, programs. We have a lot of opportunities to get together and talk about various issues. And there are issues where the states align. For example, most states agree that robocalls are distasteful, bad, their citizens hate them. So we band together and we file amicus briefs and legislative letters uh, about robocalls and we're all unified. But with a lot of issues uh, in recent years, there has been kind of a polarization along party lines. I think that is unfortunate. Um, sometimes I think there is an issue that a state really would, they would like to sign on to a multi-state amicus brief or onto a congressional letter, but they're not going to join those red states or they're not gonna join those blue states. And I think that is unfortunate. Um, I like to see those, those issues that, that cross political lines. And I, I tend to think that when we file amicus briefs and it doesn't divide along party lines, it's a, it's a stronger statement to the courts. When you look at the briefs that were filed in the pork producers case, the amicus briefs from the states, they generally divided along party lines. And if you look at the, the uh, communications with con congressional leaders, they are dividing along party lines, at least on this issue. Um, I do think sometimes that's unfortunate. Do I understand um, the other side's issues? I think uh, when you're talking about the Dormant Commerce Clause and state split, uh, there's the concern on the other side, uh, the reasons that states opposed uh, Prop 12 and the reasons that they might support the EATS Act, they ha it has to do with a concern that we are cutting off the marketplace, that, that this idea of co commerce needs to be free flowing. And the concern is that there's this what we call sort of balkanization, and that's what the courts have referred to it, this economic balkanization where states are sort of siloed off and they're functioning all by themselves. And of course, in our modern economy, that's just not how things work. Uh, and so I'm sensitive to that. And I think those are good conversations to have. I do think with respect to uh, Prop 12 and, and the EATS Act, 
Um, I follow, I, I don't see, like in the pork producer's case, I didn't see um, the concerns with the marketplace because, again, there are lots of laws that are really important to the people that are going to affect another state, but they affect them incidentally. And we have to be able to accept those incidental effects on other states because that's part of our modern economy. And the Commerce Clause and the Dormant Commerce Clause already has in place uh, adequate protections when, for when a state is protectionist and is discriminating against other states for its own economic interests, not the necessarily the interests of the people, but its own economic interests, or whether in situations where simply the balance is off, like this may be important to a state but the burden on other states is too great. So I understand that conversation and I think it's a good one to have. I do think that the court got it right in the pork producers case that that Prop 12 wasn't an example of discrimination or protectionism. And that's what the court said. This is the touchstone is economic protectionism and that's not what Prop 12 was about. Yeah, I think a lot of people make issue of the the fact that it is perceived as a 5-4 decision, but on that exact core question of the actual constitutionality, yes. it was nine zip. There was not a single Supreme Court justice yes. that, they, yeah. that this was unconstitutional. Yeah. And I, I think that's where we've really felt the strength of our amicus brief, that, that, that perhaps we had an impact on the court in going back to the core principles of what the dormant commerce clause means and the limitations on this, what we call this extraterritoriality principle. Yeah. You know, yes, there can be an effect. There are things that can affect things outside your borders, but Prop 12 didn't cross that line. And I feel the, the markets, the free market argument works exactly the opposite. No one's forcing anyone to sell pork into California. It's, to me, it's simply a market question. Like those producers that feel it's yep. worth expenditure in order to comply with prop 12 to have access to the california market will do so those that don't won't like it's a market's question let the market work yeah so, the only the only time the question the the court has really delved into the market is if there are like price fixing okay. cases those are the key cases where the court said well you can't fix a price in your state and say that no other state can can sell at a lower price i'm you know in order to compete with you. Again, that's the protectionism. But those are very uh, isolated cases. And for the most part, the court is recognizing that we live in a modern era where there's a lot, the economy is very global and interstate and and we have to, the jurisprudence has to reflect that. Great. Well, we're uh, coming to a close. We've got one time for time for one last question uh, for Alicia. Um, so kind of summing this up, if, if you're a legislator considering whether or not to support the EATS Act, what are some of the political calculations that might shape some of your decision making? And what sort of groups may you be hearing from on, on either side of this? And can you just kind of end with sharing why direct lobbying is so important in defeating this bill? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Um, you know, so with the political calculations and and what you're considering, if you are a member of Congress, figuring out what to do with this, um, you know, one thing that that whenever we walk into offices, we get asked every single time, how will this affect my state? How will this affect my boss's state? You know, they want to know how is it going to affect the constituents and the stakeholders within that state? And I mean, when you're talking about the EATS Act, we have a lot to say about that, um, you know, because of all of the state laws that it would invalidate. So that is definitely a consideration, how it's going to affect constituents living within that state. Um, you know, what kind of stakeholders are in the district? Um, are there significant ag interests in the district? How, what are we talking about in terms of how, how who those producers are? You know, are those producers in favor of the EATS Act? Are those producers, as Kelly noted, many are opposed to the EATS Act? Um, you know, what is the general... Um, ag agriculture industry look like in that state. So that's that's a lot, you know. And then idea, um, what is your your uh, political stance on um, states' rights? You know, that's another one. Are you traditionally have you been in favor of states' rights? Um, you know, are you very strongly in favor of states' rights because this is also a states' rights issue? Um, where do the ag committees fall? Where do the majorities fall on this? You know, because a lot of members do tend to align 
with um, with the ag committees, the the um, majority ag committees in the House or the Senate. Um, and then, of course, what are you hearing from lobbying interests and, and constituents? So all of those things definitely factor in. Um, you know, and I'll just note that direct lobbying, it's important for a number of reasons, notably education and advocacy. Um, you have a chance to educate in case folks are not aware of this and, and some of the true negative impacts of the EATS Act. And if they are, then you have a chance to advocate and say, look, I am representing constituents in your district, or I am a constituent in your district, and I'm here to let you know what my concerns are. So that is just a, another aspect of why direct lobbying is so important. I think the next panel is going to get into, you know, how you can kind of do that and how you can do some of that advocacy. So really looking forward to that because it is so important and you just cannot, um, you know, we, we all need to work together to, to defeat this and do some of that um, direct outreach and advocacy. Yeah, I think that's uh, hugely important. And for, you know, unless you're on the ground getting one of these measures passed or in one, litigation, one of the litigation teams, a lot of folks were sort of cheering on Prop 12 and Question 3 from the sidelines. But it's rare that we have an opportunity where there is a big piece of federal, federal legislation that every single supporter of every single group out there can call their local member of Congress and, and, and have a voice in what happens. So I think it's hugely important for people to get engaged on this. So thank you all for joining us.